As commander of NORAD and U.S. Northern Command, Admiral William Gortney is responsible for the homeland defense, defense support of civil authorities, and security cooperation on the continent of North America. He is a career naval aviator and has completed seven command tours as well as five joint tours. He has served as the director of the Joint Staff in Washington, D.C., and most recently uh, commanded the U.S. Fleet Forces Command. Thanks for asking me to be here tonight. It's a great opportunity um, to have a conversation with you, and that's what I really want to do. I'm only going to talk for about maybe 10 minutes, and then I want to hear from you. I want to hear your questions, because uh, what you find interesting, I find fascinating. Uh, it's really what, uh, why I do these sorts of things, because I, I can't read your mind. Uh, of what interests you and what matters to you. And I will give you a response, as I know it. I will tell you if I'm accountable for, uh, for the issue that you talk about. Or, and if it's not within what we call our wheelhouse inside of my, my job responsibility, my job responsibility as the commander of NORAD Northern Command, I'll just give you my opinion as Bill Gortney. And, uh, uh, and you may not like the response, but I'm just going to give it to you how I feel. All right. I've been working with NORAD NORTHCOM since I was a, a, uh, a Rear Admiral Select and Rear Admiral Lower Half Select. And in that, we call those captains in the United States Navy, colonels in the, uh, in the United States Marine Corps. And um, I've been working with them ever since. But since I took command a little over 13 months ago, I'm really struck by how many people don't really understand what NORAD and NORTHCOM do. What is our role? What is our mission? And I'm here to tell you that we span the spectrum of conflict. On one end, we're involved with nuclear command and control, nuclear warfare. On the other end, we track Santa Claus. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, how many people here have kids or grandkids? Raise your hand, all right? We might make a mistake. It's okay to make a mistake over here on the right end, nuclear warfare, but we cannot fail and track in Santa, and it's a lot of fun, and if you want to know more about that, let me know. we got a great app. We put on your flyer, uh, on your chair, a little flyer, a little trifold. So I'm not going to put PowerPoint slides in front of you. Instead, I put 40 PowerPoint slides on a piece of paper in front of you. But I'm going to walk you through them, so don't open them up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to steer you in the right direction. And the first place I want to steer you is on the very front of this that says, North American Aerospace Defense Command and U.S. Northern Command. And below that, it has our mission statements. What's interesting is we are two commands. NORAD, born of the Cold War, 1958, we're 58 years old, shaped by the Cold War and 9-11. U.S. Northern Command, born of 9-11 when there was no commander in charge of the defense of the homeland. And we created Northern Command because of it. And it's been shaped by 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina. And today, we are so much past those particular points as the mission has evolved uh, of that what we do. Now, if you read the NORAD mission statement, and I ask that you don't look down and read it, I'll just tell you, we're responsible it's a binational command. I am a Canadian commander. I report up the Canadian command and control, and I will tell you about that here in a second. But our responsibility there is North American Air Defense Command. If it flies and it's penetrating Canadian or U.S. airspace in North America, we're, we're, I'm accountable for it. It was designed to counter Soviet long-range aviation. And um, today we track uh, Russian long-range aviation or anything that flies inside that particular airspace of Canada and the United States uh, under a, a program we call Operation Noble Eagle. And it, that's a result of 9-11, to prevent another attack from the air in the homeland. U.S. Northern Command's mission is a little more complex. Its primary task, my primary task, is to defend the homeland the United States. It is not part of, we do not, it is, Canada is not, Canada responsibilities are not a part of U.S. Northern Command. And that's a pretty cool mission. I'm going on my 39th year, and my mission is to defend the homeland. It's kind of what we joined for. So it's a really, really cool mission. We execute the aerospace piece of that mission under NORAD, if that makes sense to you. So the operational control of aircraft 
and uh, to defend the homeland. We do it through NORAD chain of command. The additional responsibilities are to defend support for civil authorities. And if you look down on the mission statement, it says U.S. NORTHCOM partners, and we underline, underline the word partners, because in the traditional sense of the defense of the homeland, I'm accountable, I'm, I'm responsible. But in the non-traditional threat, say the terrorist threat, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not responsible. It's not my primary job. I'm not the person that the American people say, Bill, it's your job. That is the job of Jay Johnson at Homeland Security. And my responsibility is to partner with him and the organizations that he's in charge of and any of the diverse mission tasks that he has whether it's a, a, a weather of mass destruction event, a Hurricane Katrina, or a Superstorm Sandy, or an earthquake, that's what we work really hard on this coast, if they need the Department of Defense support, U.S. Northern Command provides for it. The other thing is to work with our, theaters, uh, our partners that live in this country. As we divide the world up in the Department of Defense, we divide the world up into six geographic combatant commanders. And those geographic combatant commanders are responsible for everything in the mill-to-mill -mill relationship of all the countries that reside in there. So I only have three I work with. One is Canada. That's pretty easy since I'm a Canadian commander. I just don't play hockey. The second is uh, the Bahamas. And the third is with Mexico. And we have a very strong, very, very strong relationship with Sedena and Samar in a mill-to-mill -mill uh, relationship as we partner with them and improve uh, their capabilities, the capa capabilities that they view that they need in uh, whatever their nation asks for. The next thing I want you to do, I want you to open up your trifold, and I want you to go to the upper right-hand corner. You guys see this on YouTube? Huh? Okay. And there's the chain of command. I think chain of command is important, understanding the chain of command. Because in my 39, going on 39 years, of service, I know that if there's two problems, it's because people don't understand their chain of command, who they work for. It's either that, or they don't understand what their person they're working for, what does the boss want? Command, we call that commander's intent in the military. So under NORAD, I work for both the president and the prime minister of Canada. As a matter of fact, there's only two of our geographic combatant commanders that have to be approved outside of a uh, confirmed by our United States Senate in order before uh, uh, being nominated for this job. Myself and General Breedlove at UCOM and SHAPE as the Supreme Headquarters Allied Commander for NATO. So the Canadian government has to approve uh, the commander of NORAD. It's defined, that's defined by the NORAD agreement. Again, 58 years old, it's very, very specific on what we can do and what we can't do but the Canadian government works for it. And so I work directly for their chief of defense staff, their chairman equivalent, their minister of defense, their secretary of defense equivalent, and their prime minister. And we just had their minister of defense in the headquarters all day yesterday, and we had him at the house last night. Um, under NORAD, I work up that same chain, but I do not work for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Per Goldwater Nichols, he is not in the accountability chain of command. So I talk to Joe Dunford every day and tell him, hey, Joe, I don't work for you, but I do need this. But, um, so how does that work for me? But he is not in the chain of, chain of command or the accountability chain of command. We work, the geographic combatant commanders and the functional combatant commanders work directly for the Secretary of Defense, and he works for the president. And of course, the president works for who? Oh, that's right, all of you all. You all passed civics. Clearly, you didn't go to the Naval Academy. So um, that's the chain of command. Underneath that, we are um, a single command, even though the staff structure is of a single uh, staff structure. When NORAD, when NORTHCOM stood up, it was two separate commands with a single commander. And the second commander was a, a gentleman named uh, Admiral Timothy Keating. He's a mentor of mine. And he had the vision to slam the two organizations together, and they are the same staff. So if they are in the Intel organization, they're the NORAD NORTHCOM Intel organization. If they're plans and policies, it's NORAD and NORTHCOM. With the exception of operations, we execute the day-to-day -day operations of NORAD mission through a separate NORAD operations officer, and we execute the NORTHCOM mission set through a separate NORTHCOM mission set uh, operations officer. 
Below them, we have uh, service components. So I have, I have from all the services, um, uh, three stars or a two star that work for us that help us do our mission as NORAD and North, as, North, as Northern Command. We have uh, Marine Forces, Marine uh, Forces North is also dual hatted as Marine Forces Reserve in New Orleans. The Navy component is a four star, Fleet Forces Command, and Naval Forces North. That was a job I had before this job. Um, and he has a, two jobs. Everybody else is purpose built. So the Army, have, we have R4 North, uh, Army Forces North, Fifth Army, San Antonio. We have Air Forces North out of Tyndall Air Force Base, and they run the, um, uh, the Air Operations Center for all of the United States and Canada. Now let's talk about our missions. And once we talk, I'm done talking about our missions, I'm going to open the floor to your questions. And inside there, it talks about the different threats that we face in the homeland. And, we'll, and I'll answer all your questions, uh, there. I'll an answer to the threats to the homeland through your questions. But the missions, again, for NORAD, if you open up your trifold on the left, it's aerospace. Again, if it's NORAD, it's aerospace focus. That is the, that North American Aerospace Defense Command. And it's aerospace warning and control. If it flies, we want to know about it. We work very closely with the FAA and the Canadian equivalent of the FAA. And then we control aircraft to, to uh, deal with any of the threats, whether they're the traditional military threat or non-traditional threat in the air. That's aerospace warning and control. We also have another task that was added a few years back, maritime warning, which is really an intel function. If we, working with our partners, to sense anything, determine anything coming into the homeland from the maritime, we're going to warn. We're going to warn all of the interagencies within the United States, which we were already doing, and within Canada. Northern Command, primary task, homeland defense. The aerospace piece is encompassed by the NORAD mission. The maritime, the naval, any, any maritime threat or a land threat, we handle that through Northern Command, and it's U.S. only. I'm going to go to the bottom, theater security cooperation, our relationships with Canada, Bahamas, and Mexico. We work with them. We average one to two sortie, uh, missions a day with the Bahamas and seven to eight missions a day supporting Sedena and Samar in Mexico. Very, very busy. And finally, defense support to, for civil authorities. This is a unique mission set for geographic combatant commanders. This encompasses supporting helping any, other, uh, any of the other lead federal agencies in the tasks that they have within the United States. So if Jay Johnson, if a governor of a state, is confronted with a, what I call a WMD event, a weather of mass destruction event, that outstrips their capacity to deal with, they will go to Homeland Security, who will turn to FEMA, and they will ask for assistance. If the Department of Defense has the capability to assist, FEMA will come to the Secretary of Defense, ask for support, and Northern Command will provide that support. We will, we will enable that particular support to assist FEMA to assist the governor of the state. If uh, we, we are very active with uh, Homeland Security, um, with one of their organizations called Custom and Border Patrol, and we have a joint task force, Joint Task Force North, that is on what we call our middle border, the Mexican-U.S. border. And they provide the Department of De Defense support to Custom and Border Patrol along that particular border. So if there's any agency that's out there, one of the things we're dealing with right now is helping Homeland Security uh, uh, preparing for unaccompanied children that are, that are dealing with the mass migration coming out of Central America. If it overstrips Homeland Security's capability, they asked us for assistance. And right now we are preparing, I think it's four bases. Holloman is the number, Holloman Air Force Base in uh, Arizona, right? Arizona? Holloman? New Mexico, thank you very much. It, as you fly over them, you lose track of the, where the borders are. And uh, we provide the facilities, but Homeland Security provides all of the assistance, the care, the feeding, and everything. We're just providing the, 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 the rooms to, to, to deal with these challenges for the children that would be there, unaccompanied families and children that would be there. So again, if there's another organization that needs Department of Defense support, U.S. Northern Command uh, provides that support. And this is where the word, if you look again on the front, partners. 
This is what's so important. We partner with people, international organizations and here in the homeland. You know, if there's one thing that, that my shipmate up here and I have learned in 14 years of war, combat's a team sport. It has nothing to do with football. Oh, you're going to have an epic game here in a couple weeks here in San Francisco. But combat is the ultimate team sport. And partnering, understand who your partners are and understanding what your needs are, what your partner's needs are, is absolutely critical. And that's where I'll take you, if you open up the, the flap to the lower right-hand corner, our key homeland partners. What's unique about Northern Command, NORAD Northern Command, is we have over 60 liaison personnel that reside inside our headquarters. And they're from all of the agencies within our, within our government, as well as our law enforcement partners. They're completely embedded into our operations and our intel fusion process. They are a part of the team. To be frank, we have our liaison officers in many of their organizations, either in their plans, planning shops, or their intel, intel organization as analysts. Because this is a team sport, whether it's a weather of mass destruction or a terrorist, potential terrorist attack. And so just this morning, I was meeting with the FBI here in San Francisco. Just last, just last Thursday, I was with the FBI in Minneapolis. I meet, I meet once a month. Next Friday, I'll meet again with Secretary Johnson of Homeland Security, partnering with them, understanding what their needs are, so that if they need the assistance of the Department of Defense, any of the agencies or, or services within the Department of Defense, we will not be late to need. We want to be there as quickly as possible, maybe with more capability than is needed, because we can always send it home. But we do not want to be late to support you, the American people. And with that, I look forward to your questions. I don't rank threats 1 to 10. It's not how we look at them. We rank threats from most likely to most dangerous. Does that, does that make sense? And sometimes the most dangerous could be the least likely depending on the nature of the threat. And so when I look at most likely to most dangerous, we'll start, I think you're asking, what is the most dangerous threat? And it's any nation that can annihilate our, our nation from the face of the earth with nuclear weapons. So what are those countries? Obviously Russia. They can annihilate us. China has just put the sea. Now they have their, their uh, seaborne ballistic leg of their triad. And any time one of their SSBNs goes to sea, we assume, we, we don't know, but we assume it's on a combat patrol. And then again, there is North Korea, um, rogue nations that may have nuclear weapons. And one of my responsibilities in that regard is if, if um, uh, the current leader of North Korea, um, I assess, because you pay me to assess most dangerous scenarios, has the ability to put a nuclear weapon on an ICBM and it can range the homeland, I have the capability to knock it down. I own the trigger of that. So when I look at the most dangerous, the most dangerous I think is Russia, then China, although China does not, has a no first use policy and I think that's, I think that's good. And then there's the un unpredictable nature of North Korea. Um, I'm a history major. My father bought my degree. I did not go to the Naval Academy. He's still pretty upset about it. Um, but uh, I look longingly for the predictable nature of the current leader's father in North Korea. I think the peninsula is more unstable today than since the armistice. As I look to the more likely, and uh, the more likely is, is what's getting ready to confront the, the northeast of our country, a weather of mass destruction, a massive storm. So just before coming in here, we we're preparing bases um, at the uh, uh, what we call uh, intermediate staging bases, where if, if, if uh, FEMA or anybody else needs to, to put capability for a location, we're preparing those bases to take that to deal with the storm. It's a weather of mass destruction event. Um, and we look at that regionally because last time I checked, earthquakes and storms don't honor state borders. Just, to, just, just my observation. Um, but then when we look at the non-traditional threat, I'm very concerned about the, um, uh, today, the very sophisticated 
um, social media campaign. It's coming out of Daesh. I will not give them credit and call them ISIL. They are the darkness. And they are motivating citizens of countries to do harm to fellow citizens. I'm not so interested in, uh, I'm not so concerned about those that are communicating back, that are active in the social media process, because if they are, we have sensors that might pick that, that might be able to pick them up. I'm very concerned about those that are just reading that social media and are radicalized to do something and are not transmitting, and, and their families do not see or are unwilling to come forward and say one of their youth has been radicalized and, uh, and are, are going to do harm. This is what happened in Chattanooga. And um, uh, so that's where we look at. And as we look at those threats, threat reports and threat streams, we measure those threats against four attributes because it's, it's, not, it's not black and white. You're really trying to take a very subjective issue and apply an objective measure to it. And we measure them against specificity, imminency, plausibility, and probability. And uh, what's hard is um, the where and the when. Because if we knew FBI, who's the Justice Department has responsibility for this, is going to be ready. And if they're, if they're going to come onto a DOD installation or some, try and do something against that, we'll be able to harden up. But it's lacking that specificity and imminency, the where and the when. Uh, causes us great concern. Because one of my other responsibilities as Northern Command is I set the force protection condition, uh, the measures that are in place for all of the DOD facilities within the continental United States. Admiral Harris at PACOM has Hawaii, but he follows whatever we do. So, Ned, I hope that answers your question. That homegrown violent extremist is really just, they're targeting disenfranchised youth. Something, something is really bothering, and they are targeting them. And they're either targeting them physically or most likely through social media as they do that. It's a lot like how you can, it's just gang warfare at the end of the day. So today's threat is from Daesh. You know, and it's very similar to what the British had to do with the IRA. It's a very similar problem set that you have to do. And it has to be solved at the local level. Um, we do not have the authorities within the Department of Defense, thank God we live in America, to do anything about that. We are supporting and planning and helping Intel, uh, Intel analysis, things of that nature. But um, uh, uh, that's all that we can do uh, other than protect our, our service members and their families as best we can. The, uh, but it, that, that's, that's how we're tackling. But you gotta remember, it is, it is, it is it, in this particular case, it's Daesh today. It can be something else before. And I don't see much difference, to be honest, between what's happening there and what your question is, sir. Next question. So, Admiral, I'm going to repeat each question because we're going to broadcast this, and that way we get a good uh, sound piece since we don't have a microphone in the audience. But that prevents me from answering the question I want to answer, and that's the question this, I ask. This is true, sir. Those, yeah. those are the Marine rules here. Okay, all right, all right. Semperfy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question is, uh, infectious diseases are part of the responsibility of Northern Command uh, to expand on that. So we synchronize the activity. So if there is a, I have a saying, don't kiss a chicken on the lips. Um, you know, don't hug a camel, things like that. But if there is a, a mechanism, we, we, we partner uh, with those responsible in the homeland and then make sure that all of the other geographic combatant commanders understand how to, and the services understand how to deal with uh, potential infectious disease. Had the current command and control structure been in place on 9-11, uh, would that attack uh, of that day have been prevented? There's a very thick report called the 9-11 Commission. It's about this thick. And in it, it's very critical of NORAD because, of course, NORTHCOM was not there. Because NORAD, uh, and they, they're critical of NORAD because NORAD postulated the threat from airliners, but they were unable to convince anybody that it was a real threat. And so NORAD um, is... Is, is criticized because they could, couldn't convince somebody that there was a potential for a threat. I don't think that's particularly fair. I've tried to make people drink water and sometimes they don't want to drink water. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you can do your best, but at the, people have to buy into the threat. The other thing is, is more important. The other critical um, uh, uh, part of the 9-11 Commission report is before 9-11, if you were part of the intel organization or law enforcement organization, you were encouraged not to share information. 
you were, you were encouraged not to. Since 9-11, no one wants to not share information. No one wants to have that golden BB of information that would be the, the final solution to the Rubik's Cube. Now, I think that is, quite frankly, a little unfair, too. I'm not sure if we had it all, we could have pieced it all together, right? And it goes to the other question, piecing it all together and convincing somebody that there's a, there, there's a threat there. But the important thing since 9-11 is how law enforcement and intel communities work together and share information to find out is it credible, specific, plausible, imminent. Uh, those are the, those are the uh, important thing. Um, I think the chain of command that you see in that upper right-hand quadrant is more important for two things um, today. One is the traditional threat to the homeland. You know, we're returning to great power competition. Uh, Secretary Work, Deputy Secretary of Defense, talks about it. And, you know, since the fall of the Cold War 25 years ago, the fall of the, uh, uh, of the Berlin Wall, um, we pretty much were a unilateral superpower. And even though we've been fighting for 15 years of war, today there's the, re there's the reemergence of Russia and there's the rise of China. And so we have to remember there's great potential for great power conflict. It's the reality, okay? And we need to be able to deal with it. And the capabilities that Russia is developing and Russia is developing, there is a need for, I believe, a commander that is responsible for the defense of the homeland against the traditional threats against all domains. And that's U.S. Northern Command and everything but cyber. And cyber can, cyber, uh, uh, homeland security is responsible for the cyber threat for the homeland. But for against the traditional threat, that's, that I believe there's clearly a responsibility. The other thing about that is when there is a, uh, a defense support for civil authorities, if, a, if another agency needs support, we work through our components who work with their ser parent services to provide that capability. We provide the command and control to attach the capability, the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, and coast guardsman, to then deal whatever the task happens to be. Okay. Sir, let's stay on NORAD for a minute and just have a follow-up question to that. So. Uh, are we in better shape today to intercept this kind of a threat? One of the big discussions after 9-11 was we had F-16s and mm -hmm. F-15s up in the air. Some of them launched without any weapons uh, on them. Um, we, have, we have different procedures now. What do you do if there's, whether it's a, a commercial airliner that is taken over, which is very unlikely because the security situation there is pretty robust, but more likely a private type of an aircraft that's been identified as not responding and that's moving to a position that, that could yep. be a target. What's the procedure that you go through and what's the timeline? How quickly can we respond to that threat? On the morning of 9-11, everybody that's involved with flying airplanes or controlling airplanes picked up the phone and been on a conference call ever since. The phones have never been hung up. And um, we maintain uh, fighters on alert throughout Canada and the United States to be able to deal with that potential threat. And we work very, very closely with the uh, FAA and with the uh, organizations that support general aviation, AOPA, Aircraft Owners and Pilot Association, on, on training uh, uh, general aviation aviators, which I am if Sherry would let me buy another airplane, uh, 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 one, potential one of those owners, uh, train them where they can fly and where they can't fly. And, um, and we have what we call, that's Operation No Legal, and we have one of those conference calls at least once or twice a day for someone that is flying where they shouldn't be. I'm not so worried about the uh, airliner threat uh, that much today. I mean, we have a pretty good handle and there's a whole back-end process that supports how people, who's on airplanes and who, how they don't and how they're screened, all responsibility of Homeland Security through uh, uh, TSA. Um, but the, if there is one, it's uh, where there's seams, you can find your seam and you find your enemy, right? That's what you and I That's were right. brought up to train, uh, to learn. And it uh, could be that general aviation or the light commercial aircraft that doesn't have the security that the other side of the airfield has. So if, that, if that's an area, and that's where we're working, trying to close those particular seams. So a two-part question. First, you know, what is the most likely uh, type of threat uh, from China? And the second piece is on the topic of drones, commercially available drones falling into the hands of extremists 
and being used in a, a, a manner uh, that would constitute terrorism on the homeland. Okay, two-part answer to the first, long answer to the third. First one from China, cyber, they're stealing us blind. They're stealing our intellectual property. Um, I do not believe uh, their premier that said they're gonna stop doing it. I don't believe that for a second. And uh, they're in our networks. And if they're in our networks, and, and we haven't seen any physical damage uh, from that, but they can leave things back there that if they want to, they can do something about it. So uh, they cannot keep their economy going without stealing our intellectual property, and they're stealing us blind. They're stealing you blind. Fact. Next with China is the South China Sea. Not in my wheelhouse, not my responsibility as the NORAD Northern Commander. This is Bill Gortney answering, and my best friend is Harry Harris, who's the PACOM Commander. Um, not following the international rules of norm and scaring their neighbors and the potential for conflict in the South China Sea is very, very high as they are taking artificial reefs and building island, building airstrips, defending those airstrips. Claiming territory by international standards is not theirs and they're not following the rules on that. And so the potential for conflict and miscalculation, I think in the future over the next uh, five to 10 years, very, very high with China. Watching it very, very closely. Um, the drones. <clears throat> I think Amazon sells 15,000 quadrocopters a month. I think that's the number. Um, uh, from the threat perspective to the homeland, I'm not so worried. As an aviator, I'm terrified that one day one of these quadrocopters is going to get sucked down the left side of an engine of a 767. And so just on Friday, uh, this next Friday, um, I'll be with Homeland Security with Secretary Johnson and the team that's tackling on how we're going to deal with these, with all of the agencies that are going to be there. And when you look at the drone problem, there's three classes of people that you need to worry about. The first are the 99.999999% of Americans that are law-abiding citizens that just don't know where they should fly them and where they shouldn't. And so working with industry, that when they open up their box, and I just bought one for uh, my six-year-old grandson. It's eminently cool. It's only about this big. Um, you know, where can you fly it? Where can't you fly it? You register it for free. You just get on the FAA website. It takes about two minutes to register it. And then you can download an app, uh, one for, uh, uh, from the Apple Store, and they're working on the Android app, that you, before you fly, where can you fly it, where can't you fly it? And it knows where you are, so it can say, yeah, you're good to fly here, or no, don't fly it here. So it's an education issue. Um, uh, the next piece, the next group, are those that know they shouldn't be flying it somewhere and are flying it anyway. That's criminal activity. So if you're within 10 miles of Reagan, you're not supposed to fly a drone there, quadrocopter there. A couple of months ago, wasn't very expensive fine. You probably need a loan today to pay off that fine. So punish those that are choosing to not do something. The last one is someone who's gonna try and use the drone for nefarious activity. And in that regard, given the nature and the size of the drone, how much damage can that drone possibly do? I mean, you can load a Prius up with explosives, find out how to build that explosive on the internet today, and drive it anywhere you want to and do far more damage than you can with this little drone. So in that last category, I'm not too worried. If it's big enough to do that, as the NORAD commander, depending on where you are in the country, I probably have the sensors to, to detect you and then pass that information off to somebody that will be able to finish it if I can't finish it. So that's a very, very low likely. So I'm more concerned about that other side education, and then punishing those that are choosing to not follow the rules. Admiral, part of your uh, area of responsibility includes the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of questions related to that. First of all, uh, the Russians have moved significant, uh, well, military forces in, in preparation for you know, economic initiatives and, and opening that area up for uh, moving uh, goods and, and trade. How does that uh, impact us, and what is climate change doing in a broader uh, sense in terms of your command? Yeah, well, I have two tasks when it comes to the Arctic. 
One is the defense of the homelands, Canada and the United States, because the Arctic is a path of attack from our adversaries, whether from space or from air, because the world's round, and that's the easiest way to get to us. And quite frankly, you know, we have F-22s up in Alaska, home base in Alaska, and we can get them anywhere in the world faster than we can to the F-22s based at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. So, the, so it is all about the geography, the strategic importance of Alaska. Geo I mean, location, location, location. Any realtors in here? You know, or location, location, location. And it's an avenue of attack. And so that's my number one concern. I do have a, an additional assigned task that I am the uh, advocate for the Arctic for the Department of Defense. Now, you're schooled at military war colleges. What is the doctrinal term? What does advocate mean? Yeah, you don't really own it. You're just representing. Uh, you got the, it wrong. Thank God you're a Marine. <laughs> and because um, there's not a doctrinal term. That was a trick question. It was a trick question. In the question. Navy, they yeah. always do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, it's, it's, it, there's, you don't open up the book and go, oh, this is what it means. Because we like to know what words mean. Words matter. And um, so the good news about that is, is we, can make, we can answer the question as being the advocate any way we want to. The bad news is people that don't agree with us can try and say, no, you're not answering the question the right way. Being an advocate, you, this, this assume, you assume additional responsibilities. But we're trying to answer that capability that within all of the Department of Defense, the services, the geographic combatant commanders, the functional combatant commanders, the various agencies that we have, what are the capabilities that we need to, to operate in the Arctic? Because the Arctic is changing. And it's a very emotional issue. And I try and answer, I found in, in my years of service that uh, answering questions fact-based gets you a better answer than emotionally based. And when it comes to the Arctic, the spectrum of conflict is on one end, that's where you're gonna go for your vac summer vacation instead of the Bahamas. And I just don't wanna see you in a Speedo. And, and, and the right-hand side is that nothing's changed. And the truth is always in the middle somewhere. And to be honest, the Arctic is more dangerous today because the Arctic is changing. But in order to operate in the Arctic, there's three things we have to solve. We have to be able to communicate up there. We have to be able to navigate up there. And we have to be able to sustain ourselves up there. Now, the first two is just pure science. We'll figure it out. I mean, we landed a man on the moon or we faked it. Either one was an incredible technological feat. We're the greatest nation in the world. And we'll figure that out. Navy's got four satellites up there. We had a Coast Guard cutter go all the way up to the North Pole, and we were able to communicate with them most of the way. We forgot to tell Santa that Coast Guard cutter was coming. So he was pretty upset. But um, the navigation, we can clearly figure out. But the sustainment piece is really, really hard. It is a harsh place. It is more dangerous today than it's ever been because of the changing nature of it. And uh, uh, I've been north of the Arctic Circle on four occasions. I took Sherry, my lovely wife, my high school sweetheart, to the center, uh, north central part of Alaska for Valentine's Day um, uh, to meet with the families up there on a base that we have up there. I'm a romantic fool. It didn't help. And um, it is a harsh place. Uh, we have NORAD fighter bases that are north of the Arctic Circle. We have to take everything with us up there, fuel, food, everything, uh, because the population can't support other than themselves because there's such, there's such a short duration that they can ship in what they need to survive up there. So the sustainment piece is the long pole, will be the long pole in the tent. And then what's, what we're really trying to answer as we figure out the communication, navigation, and sustainment. And this is where both ends of the spectrum come to a stalemate. Once we figure that out, in order to do what? In order to do what? And uh, that's a real tough question. But from myself as the NORAD NORTHCOM perspective, in order to do what is you want me to defend you from that as an avenue attack. And we, we look at it in that respect. It's a, it is how are we gonna deal with it?
I often get the question about, because Russia is putting a lot of resources, military resources, recapitalizing their, their Arctic bases. And there's two reasons. One, they have the longest, um, uh, the second longest coastline in the Arctic. The longest is Canada. Um, but they also, to get their resources out, they need, the, they need to keep their sea lines of communication open. And so they're investing in their military capability up there. And as a military officer, since I have no interest up there other than defensive in nature, if they want to invest their defense dollars up there, let them. They're not investing it someplace else. Next question. Sir, uh, just, just to clarify, I'm not going on vacation to the Arctic anytime soon. Okay. Uh, but you are in San Francisco, and, and you know, uh, it's a standard issue piece of gear, the Speedo here. So just so you really, if you spot anybody in the Tenderloin or in the Haight-Ashbury okay. district, okay. you know. Well, uh, thanks for the warning. Sir, uh, I'll, I'll grab another question in a minute. On the subject, I have a couple of question cards. On the subject of defense support to civilian authorities, uh, two very good questions. One is, is there still a war on drugs, or is that something that is gone? And really, in, in light of Mexico, heroin, cocaine, still moving across the border at pretty rapid rates, maritime and by land, and then the issue of guns and firearms, which are very strictly regulated in Mexico, going south of the border. We have two supply and demand problems, and it's not a military problem, but it is in your area of interest yeah, as you partner with all these agencies. I do partner with them, and uh, we partner north of the border uh, to tackle it, and we partner with Sedan and Samar to assist them as they're working it from, uh, south of the border and capabilities that they need. Uh, there's a war on drugs. I think we're losing it. And, um, uh, you know, this is a national problem. And we can't tackle it if you want to tackle it north of the border or south of the border, you have to tackle it on both, on, on all aspects of the border and quite frankly on our flanks and from the north. And if we don't get our demand signal under control inside of our country, we're going to continue to lose the war on drugs, right? Um, the current uh, is heroin. And we have heroin moving in because it's cheaper than cocaine uh, in massive quantities into the country. And it's killing the youth. It's killing the youth of our nation. And we, sh we as citizens should be very, very concerned about that. Today, um, coming out of Mexico, um, uh, it is heroin and methamphetamines that are coming through the border. And predominantly, heroin and methamphetamines coming through uh, south around San Diego. Uh, just about, when was it, guys? About three weeks ago, we were, we were crawling through one of the tunnels between Mexico and San Diego. It's about this high. I could stand up. Uh, in it. It was a joke. Um, the, um, uh, as we go there, the heroin is being produced uh, in, in, um, in Mexico. The methamphetamines is being, uh, I guess, mixed in, uh, in Mexico, but the precursors are all coming from China, massive factories in China. And so uh, we got to tackle both those particular problems. Um, I think the legalization, legalization of marijuana in our country is causing me problems. Um, uh, it comes up in every one of my discussions with uh, the leaders of General Cienfuegos and Abel Sobran, uh, Sedan and Samar, who view the legalization problem the way I do, as a father and a grandfather, as an issue. We actually are exporting marijuana to Mexico because our THC content is higher than what they can grow down there. Only in America would we do something like this. Um, uh, as we go forward. The, um, they're moving product. The cartels are moving product. And they're moving the kind of product that people want to buy. And they're moving it any way they can in the find the seams. And so we as a nation need to work on both sides of this issue. And, and uh, we really need to focus on the demand side in our nation. Yeah, the question is, how is Mexico helping in the, in the, the fight against drug trafficking? Yeah. Well, my responsibility as the Northern Command Commander is to work the military-to-military -military relationship in the capacity building of their Army and their Navy. Um, and so that's what we do. There are other agencies in our government that work the other agency-to-agency -agency coordination, but my responsibility is work Sedan and Samar. 
I've been working with Mexico, uh, Sedan and Samar, predominantly Samar, their Navy, for a long time, since about 2004, 2005, and it's been a game changer over the last four years. As they've been asked, both Sedan and Samar have been asked by their government, told by their government, that they're going to work on the internal security and challenges uh, that, are, that are being confronted. It's a very tough mission for professional military officers to do, to work on this particular mission set. Uh, uh, but they're good soldiers and sailors, and they salute, and they're executing, and we are working with them, and they are taking bad people off the streets. Okay? They're doing very, very good. They, the capability that we've taught them between uh, our Army and our Marine Corps and our special operators and our intel fusion process, they've outstripped the capability that we've gotten them. I, I consider both General Cienfuegos and Admiral Soberon friends. Sherry and I consider we, we've been to their house, they've been to our house. Um, they, are, they are very, very motivated. They work together, they're joint, which is really, really unusual, um, uh, new uh, as they go forward. But they have an immense challenge. And from Admiral Soberon's words, the number one problem that they have is corruption. And if they don't get their corruption problem under control, uh, they're, they're, they're in for a really long slog, which is already a 25 to 30 year, 30 year problem. Um, you know, somehow they have to find and convince to pay their civil servants enough money to make the right decision. Don't have to make them rich, but you have to pay them enough to make the right decision and organize them correctly in order to tackle that. So the question is the scope, the scope <laughs> and scale of Northern Command, how do you prioritize your day? What are your strategic and operational level concerns? And how do you oversee such a vast uh, organization, really two, with, between NORAD and NORTHCOM? Actually, the question he asked was much easier to answer than the one you <laughs> translated. Um, when do you sleep? Yeah, if, if you've ever worked with me, I'm an organization and process guy. Uh, activity without organization and process produces no results. So that, that's, that's just me. And um, I'm also known as a problem solver. So uh, cut to the root of a problem, find a solution, develop a plan, follow through to fruition. And, um, uh, and one of the other things I do is, of all the assigned tasks we have, I break things down into categories. We call them lines of operation. Uh, homeland defense is one of those lines of operation. Uh, theater security cooperation, um, uh, support the civil authorities, uh, the Arctic, um, what are our part, who are our partners, international and, and, and uh, uh, within our government? Understanding your relationships that you need to do things. And then we map our activity back to those lines of operation because if you're doing activity that doesn't map back to the one of those operations, you either have a line of operation you didn't know about or you're doing work you shouldn't be doing. And uh, I don't want to do work that's someone else's responsibility. I got enough on my plate. And then within that you have to prioritize. And so uh, the number one task force is the defense of the homeland through the traditional and the non-traditional threat. And the traditional threat I'm in charge of and I know I know what I need to do. And in the non-traditional threat, I'm supporting Homeland Security Justice in order to do that and where I have authorities to do that. Um, and that's what we do. And then you delegate a lot. You know, I, I, I am not a micromanager. Um, uh, I believe in delegation and holding people accountable for the tasks that I give them. And, then, and they tell me what they need, what authorities and resources they need, and it's my job to go get it for them. And then they tell me when it's mission complete. You know, I find that's a, a good way to do business. Um, uh, so that's, that's how we do it. I often get asked, you know, what keeps me up at night? It's one of my favorite answers a 12-year-old blind and diabetic miniature schnauzer <laughs> and a 60-year-old bladder. And because um, uh, uh, I sleep pretty well at night. And the reason I sleep well at night is because um, in the defense of the homeland, it's an away game. You do not want to defend the homeland from the catcher's mitt perspective. You need people that, can, that take the fight and fight the fight forward and that build the conditions that keep stability afar. And that's the importance of the four deployed geographic combatant commanders who are not there. Their primary task is to prevent conflict from ever occurring, create the conditions and the stability and work on those areas that, uh, that uh, prevent conflict. Because it's always cheaper to win a war by not fighting it than try and fight it. In the homeland, 
Uh, I have, I only mustered 2,700 soldier, sailor, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen a day, predominantly Guardsmen who do the Operation Noble Eagle mission and the Ballistic Missile Defense mission. And they do phenomenal work. They're well trained, they have the great capability, and they execute really, really well. And if it's something bad, I know I'm going to get the capability that's out there. And then um, uh, I'm very confident of my mission partners that I support. Uh, the other interagency partners. And we're a great nation. We are a great nation. Do we have challenges? Yeah. But there's, there's too many people think that, you know, we wear the cloth of the nation because we're wearing this uniform. Last time I checked, no one got drafted into Homeland Security. No one got drafted to be a policeman or a fireman or first responder. They too are wearing the cloth of our nation. They're supporting the very society that we're supporting. We do it overseas. I'm doing it here in the homeland but we predominantly do it overseas. So I sleep well at night. Next question. In, in terms of uh, San Francisco is, is a great city and it's, it is a military town, even though all the military bases uh, that used to be here, and there's about a dozen of them that were within a, a 50 mile radius, most of those went away with the base realignment p uh, piece of the mid 90s, but it really still uh, treats its military well. Uh, and this town always has. Um, when the, Senator Dianne Feinstein was the mayor, she started Fleet Week here, and San Francisco's Fleet Week is really, in my opinion, uh, the best in, in the nation. And it's, it brings the Blue Angels, it brings the, the sailors of uh, Canada as well as the United States, um, and we spend a week uh, celebrating our fleet and our maritime history. At the same time, we do something very special here, and it happens here in the Marines Memorial Club, and that's we, we rehearse the re disaster response scenarios for a city like this after an earthquake, after a tsunami, after any kind of natural disaster. And we bring the senior leaders of FEMA, of the state, of the city, of the military uh, entities in California, they all come here and they, what you talked about, it's an interagency meeting, people meet each other face to face, and we actually rehearse these things, and we study what happened in Nepal last year in the earthquake, what happened in the Philippines the year before that with the tsunami. Um, San Francisco Fleet Week is a, a, a wonderful thing that I know NORTHCOM supports. Absolutely. And so on NPR and in front of the world, I'm going to ask you for your support again in the coming years, and we'd love to export that to other cities so that we can get that same kind of synergy between interagency. Absolutely. You know, the, uh, uh, we've learned that in combat, you don't in combat, you don't rise to your expectations. You fall to the level of your training. And, uh, and so we work very, very closely with the, with the earthquake scenario here. We do two major exercises in Northern Command. One of them is uh, uh, um, uh, a weather of mass destruction event. We did it for Los Angeles, uh, with Los Angeles and Arizona um, in the fall. Uh, uh, this year on how we're going to provide the DO to support when it, when it exceeds the capability that the governor and, and his emergency manager can do. You know, I've never seen um, uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guard more motivated than when, are, when they're helping fellow American citizens in a time of need. You know, they're really motivated. And um, they're going to show up and they're going to help. Uh, you know, Sandy, we had reservists from all the services just put on their uniform and just went to work. And uh, 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 it, just because that's what they want to do. And so uh, we look forward. We, we do not want to be in charge. NORTHCOM, military does not want to be in charge of this. There are scenarios where NORTHCOM could be in charge. I don't want that to ever happen because that's a very bad day for America. But we love being good supporting commanders and we're going to show up and we're going to be late to need. Sir, as an infantryman, I have to ask you one more question, and it's about an airplane. And uh, All right, I've you, connected those would, two would thoughts. Would you answer that? Sure. So the F-35 uh, aircraft is, is the, the most modern, amazing piece of technology that we've produced in a long time. But I'm looking at the, the budget around one piece of military hardware, and that's the F-35. Yeah. The uh, Air Force version, the Alpha, costs $148 million a copy. The Marine F-35B 
uh, comes in at $251 million a copy because it needs to be a vertical takeoff, short takeoff landing type of aircraft. The Navy version that needs to be able to withstand landing on a carrier deck, uh, $337 million. The average cost of a Joint Strike Fighter is $178 million. And then it comes with a helmet that's worth $400,000 that you wear this helmet. In, in an age where our defense budget is shrinking, um, and I know you're kind of partial to the muscle car called the F-18, because uh, that was your airplane. We could buy four F-18s for the cost of one joint strike fighter. Um, I wouldn't ask you to, to question the decision making uh, necessarily of our procurement people, but is it really, are we getting the bang for the buck? Is this worth the cost? And what are we giving up in the future years as the defense budget is scheduled to shrink? Yeah. Um, well, first, I'm a, I'm a pilot, and I love airplanes. They're cool. Um, I'm second generation naval aviator. Uh, the, the question is, what is the right mix at the end of the day? Because we can't afford um, all that we want, right? And, uh, you know, we're not teenagers. Didn't get a chuckle. Um, <laughs> the, the question, though, is what is the right mix of high and low? So I won't speak to um, the Air Force or the, Navy or the Marine Corps' requirement. I, I, I think I'm, as the senior naval aviator on active duty, Navy and Marine aviator on active duty, I think I can comment from the Navy. And the Navy has always been a mix of high capability and low capability, because we've never been able to afford 100% high. Um, and that's with ships and airplanes. And so on an aircraft carrier, having the right mix of capability is what is the most important thing to me and within the fleet. We are a system of systems. And um, if you overbuy in one system and underbuy in, in a lesser system, then the system of systems may fail in combat. So I look at it more from a system of systems approach. What are the systems I need? And so that if I overbuy or underbuy, it's an informed choice and it's not an emotional choice, if that makes sense. Um, so we want in the Navy the F-35, but we have 44 fighters that we put in a, on an aircraft carrier in our air wings. 10 of them, or only 10 of them are gonna be F-35s. The rest are going to be Super Hornets. And so we need to also make those Super Hornets as capable as we possibly can so the system of systems can fight. And I can't do that at the expense of airborne early warning and jamming and helicopters, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So I think it's important that we buy the correct mix of system of systems um, and that we have the options uh, to do that. I will also tell you, uh, this is no surprise to anybody, that I'm a fan of competition in the industrial base. And as our industrial base has shrunk, um, uh, we are losing our technological advantage of competition. And so it's no secret that I do not want a single company building the fighters for the United States of America, because it will stifle the uh, intellectual uh, capital and our ability to um, produce the best capability at the best cost. You know, we're, we're in, when we look at industry and we look at the military, industry must make a profit for their shareholders. We in the military want to get the best capability and capacity at the best cost for the American taxpayers. And I firmly believe that the only way that we come to the middle ground solution, I mean, what makes a great marriage? You all are married, right? What makes a great, how long have you all been married? 44 years. 44 years. And what, sir, makes a great marriage? My being quiet. <laughs> I call it compromise and a visa card. And, um, but to get to the middle ground solution that forces the middle ground, that gets the profit for the, for the shareholders and the best value for the American taxpayer, competition brings people to the center. And, uh, and so I like having competition. Um, in order to breed uh, the intellectual best. You know, why are we the greatest military and the greatest uh, nation in the world? First off, why are we the greatest nation in the world? It's not our military. It's you and business. It's our economy and it's our businesses. That is the strength of America. 
we back that up in the military. We take the very best of the youth of America. 23% of high school graduates in America Day are only eligible to get into the military. And we're in competition with you if you're in industry to do that. But we take the very best of the youth of America. They are, they are bright kids. We combine them with the very best of American technology. We then give them the best leadership. And then here's the real secret sauce. We top it off with the very best training. And that's, what, that's why no one will defeat us on a battlefield. And so, now we're not cheap. We're the all-volunteer force. And going on 15 years of war, 15 years of war, our nation's been at war. Less than 1% of America has raised their right hand and sworn to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Less than 1% of America. So if there's 1% that's out there, anybody out there? Is that 1% in this audience? Any part of this 1%? Stand up. Raise up, stand up. Give this gentleman a big round of applause for doing that. And you know what I think is fascinating in that 15 years of war, that 1%, we've never had better support from the American people. It's been unbelievable. Many Americans may question why we're in the war, the wars, but they've never questioned the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman that's been in that fight. And so I want to thank you for that. But we need your support now more than ever as we move forward. We can't be fatigued. And I tell all of my shipmates and wingmen and battle buddy that are in uniform, we cannot take for granted the support of the American people, which is why we're here talking to you tonight. Because we need your support. Our, our service members in the future need your support just as much. And our wounded need your support. And the families of the fallen need your support. Because um, uh, it's been that 1%, less than 1%, who's been bearing the burden. So thank you for that support. Sir, we've, uh, we've reached our time. We are, are very appreciative. And uh, on behalf of General Myatt, uh, I would like to invite you to Fleet Week or uh, elements of your staff to come and see how we do things. Uh, former Secretary of State George Schultz usually leads the Senior Leader yep. Seminar, and it's really a, a, a wonderful thing. And so if, uh, if your schedule is open in October, uh, we'd love to have you here. Uh, if I can be here, I'll be here, but I know my staff's here. Yes, sir, your, your staff has always supported us, and we appreciate yep. that going forward. And uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Admiral Gortney will be around for a short while afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much.